Hi, I'm Amy Goodman. Come to democracynow.org on November 8th to watch Democracy Now!'s three-hour midterm election night special. We'll be covering the key congressional races, which will determine the balance of power in Congress. Plus, we'll look at gubernatorial races and ballot initiatives around the country. Join us to hear the voices of activists, analysts, grassroots leaders discussing how the movements on the ground will go forward following these critical midterm elections. You can watch online at democracynow.org starting at 9 p.m. Eastern, Tuesday, November 8th. From New York, this is Democracy Now! Right now, all we know is that Alia stopped drinking water 50 hours ago. We don't know where he is. We don't know if he's alive. I asked the British authorities to get us some proof that Alia is alive and conscious. I did not get any response. The family of the imprisoned Egyptian dissident Alia Abdel Fattah says they no longer know if he's dead or alive. More than 50 hours after he stopped drinking water in an intensification of a six-month hunger strike. We'll hear Allah's sister, Sana Saif, speak at the UN Climate Summit today in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. We'll also look at what today's midterm elections could mean for the climate crisis. Then to Arizona, where Republicans are attempting to suppress voting on Native American reservations. Times have changed. Our ancestors have bows and arrows. We have democracy, our vote, our voice. Together, as sovereign nations, we have a powerful voice. Go vote and make a difference. Then election protection. We'll speak to the head of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. I'm here to warn you of another effect of these lies, the rapid deterioration of our democracy and unprecedented threats of violence and intimidation against election officials, black communities, and other communities of color all around this country. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. It's Election Day in the United States. The pivotal midterm elections will determine who controls the House and Senate, as well as many state houses. A record 43 million people cast their ballots early. The Pennsylvania Senate race between Democrat John Fetterman and the Trump-backed Mehmet Oz is one of today's most closely watched contests. On Monday, Fetterman filed a federal lawsuit in an effort to have mail-in ballots be counted, even if they're undated or improperly dated. Meaning Meanwhile, Republicans have sued to disqualify thousands of mail-in ballots in key swing states, including Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin. On Monday, President Biden warned the future of democracy is at risk. Today, we face an inflection point, one of those moments that comes around every three or four generations. We know in our bones that our democracy is at risk, and we know that this is your moment to defend it, preserve it, protect it, choose it. We'll have more on the elections later in the broadcast. And tune in tonight, when Democracy Now! will be airing a three-hour election night special beginning at 9 p.m. Eastern. In news from the United Nations Climate Summit in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, several leaders of the African Union said today their countries cannot afford the cost of adapting to the impacts of the climate crisis. In their remarks at COP27, they urge richer nations fulfill their promise of paying climate reparations for disproportionately fueling the climate catastrophe. This comes as a new report finds the United States is falling far short of contributing its fair share to UN-backed climate finance goals. The analysis by the UK-based climate news source Carbon Brief found the U.S. should be paying nearly $40 billion annually towards the UN's $100 billion climate finance target. Instead, the U.S. has paid less than $8 billion. Meanwhile, another major report published Monday warns global warming has pushed the planet's stores of ice to a widespread collapse that was unthinkable just 
almost a decade ago, with some level of Arctic sea ice certain to vanish in summer months before the year 2050, even as countries drastically reduce their fossil fuel emissions. Climate scientists say the only way to avoid further catastrophe is to take urgent steps now. If fossil fuel pollution is allowed to continue to grow, the Arctic could lose most of its sea ice by 2030. In more news from Egypt, fear over the deteriorating health of British Egyptian human rights activist and political prisoner Al Abdel Fattah is mounting as his family says they don't know if he's alive or dead. On Monday, his mother, Professor Leila Swaif, waited for 10 hours outside the gates of the desert prison where her son is being held, hoping to receive his weekly letter that never arrived. His family believes prison authorities may be force feeding Abdel Fattah. They're now demanding Ending proof of life, as Abdel Fattah intensified a six-month hunger strike by giving up water altogether over 50 hours ago. On Sunday, the opening day of the UN Climate Summit, COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. This is a sister Sanasef speaking from Sharm el Sheikh Monday. I, I'm really scared. Um, it's, it's now been over 24 hours where he stopped water. And I, I read online, like, what happens to the body, and it's for a normal body, he can endure maximum a week. Alec's body is not normal, he's very frail. So I don't know if we're talking about hours or days. I'm, I'm really, really scared. We'll hear Sana Saif's full address at the UN Climate Summit after headlines. In the Netherlands, Dutch border guards arrested more than 100 climate activists on Saturday after over 500 demonstrators spread out, spread out across Amsterdam's main airport and blocked private jets from taking off. The protesters are demanding a ban on unnecessary short-haul flights and the widespread use of highly polluting private aircraft by wealthy elites. They also want authorities to cancel a planned expansion of Amsterdam's airport. In Ukraine, Russian-appointed officials say they've completed a mass evacuation of Kherson ahead of an anticipated Ukrainian assault to recapture the city. Ukraine's called the evacuation a forced deportation and a war crime, and accused Russian forces of looting abandoned homes and quartering soldiers inside. Meanwhile, Russia has blamed Ukraine for destroying power lines to Kherson, leading to widespread blackouts and the loss of tap water beginning Sunday. Meanwhile, the Russian Defense Ministry Monday sought to dampen growing anger inside Russia over recent battlefield losses in Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region. On Monday, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky said hundreds of Russian troops, many of them recent conscripts, were being killed there each day. The Donetsk region remains the epicenter of the greatest madness of the occupiers. Hundreds die daily. The ground before the Ukraine positions is littered with bodies of the occupiers. The U.S. Air Force has carried out joint air drills with South Korea that included a flyover by a pair of supersonic nuclear-capable B-1B bombers. The weekend military exercises came as the U.S. and South Korea agreed to extend war games involving hundreds of warplanes and thousands of troops. The drills came as North Korea test-fired more than 30 missiles over the past week, including an intercontinental ballistic missile on Thursday that triggered evacuation alerts in Japan. In Italy, at least 89 asylum seekers on board a German humanitarian aid rescue ship were allowed to disembark in the coastal city of Reggio Calabria early on Tuesday, after days of being stranded in the Mediterranean Sea. Another Norwegian-run rescue ship with some 250 asylum seekers is still stuck in the Sicilian coast, as Italian officials have for days blocked its passengers from disembarking. Three people jumped off the boat in desperation as they attempted to reach safety, while others screamed for help. Back in the United States, Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett has rejected another challenge to the Biden administration's student debt relief plan. The Education Department has approved 16 million borrowers for up to $20,000 of relief each, but it's unclear when they'll actually see their loans canceled or reduced thanks to a Republican-led lawsuit, which has put Biden's plan on hold while an appeals court weighs its merits.
A federal judge in Washington, D.C., has temporarily suspended a four-month prison sentence and a $6,500 fine for Trump White House chief strategist Stephen Bannon, pending an appeal. Bannon was sentenced for criminal contempt of Congress last month after he refused to comply with a subpoena issued by the House January 6 committee. The judge who suspended Bannon's sentence, U.S. District Judge Carl Nichols, was nominated to the federal bench in 2019 by then-President Donald Trump. And Twitter's new billionaire owner is using the social media platform to call on U.S. voters to elect Republicans to Congress. Musk's endorsement to his 115 million Twitter followers came a day ahead of the U.S. midterm elections. The same day, the League of Women Voters of California said Twitter unexpectedly suspended the account of its executive director. The League's San Francisco chapter tweeted, quote, no warning, no explanation, no way to appeal. What is next, they said. The executive director's account came back online overnight. She said Twitter informed her it had mistakenly taken her offline, along with a batch of spam accounts. In an email to volunteers, she wrote, quote, We should all be concerned, not for me, but for how this impedes access to democracy and silences a source of trustworthy election information. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, we begin today's show in Egypt, at the U.N. Climate Summit in Sharm el-Sheikh, where climate justice activists are calling on the Egyptian government to free Ala Abdel Fattah, one of Egypt's best-known political prisoners. Ala has been on hunger strike for six months, stopped drinking water Sunday, as the U.N. Climate Summit began in Egypt. He has now gone over 50 hours without water. His family says they no longer know if he's still alive or if he's being force-fed. The family is also appealing to the British government for help, since Allah has British citizenship as well as his Egyptian citizenship. Just before our broadcast, Allah's sister Sana Saif spoke at a news conference inside the UN Climate Summit in Sharm el Sheikh. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for the global uh, campaign to demand climate justice, for their support, and for hosting me. Uh, my family and I have been so moved to see the huge support that Ale has had from climate organizations from across the world. I hope that one day we can repay you, really. It's heartwarming. At this conference, the, the most vulnerable are supposed to negotiate with the most powerful. So I want to say that whatever chance my brother has at surviving will come from people who are vulnerable. It will come from those paying the price for others' luxury, from those locked into a system they did not choose. Although this has been the most difficult time my family has ever faced, whatever happened, I feel like Ali has won the cause. Uh, the symbolic battle has been won uh, by your show of support. I just hope his body and he is not sacrificed for it. He's not in prison for the Facebook post they charged him with. He's in prison because he's someone who makes people believe the world can be a better place. He's someone trying to make the world a better place. And if he could see everything that so many people have done for him, he would be comforted that he's right. I know he would be very happy. So we have not yet been defeated. But right now, all we know is that Ali stopped drinking water 50 hours ago. We don't know where he is. We don't know if he's alive. Um, my mother waited outside the prison gates for 10 hours yesterday for her weekly letter. They didn't give her one. She's back at those gates right now. I asked the British authorities to get us some proof that Ali is alive and conscious. I did not get any response. Right here in this conference center, <clears throat> the Egyptian foreign minister, who is also the COP president, has been giving interviews saying there is nothing to worry about and that the prison have medical facilities. President Sisi made a commitment to President Macron that Talia's health will be preserved. And these statements really worried me. Are they force feeding my brother right now? Is he handcuffed in a bed put on IVs against his will? 
this is what it sounds like to me when they say preserve his health, but not acknowledge his hunger strike and not allow consular access. For, <clears throat> for the entire time Ali has been on a hunger strike, the prison refused to allow him an independent medical examination. They forged a fake medical report in July without examining him. They said he has access to three meals a day while he was on hunger strike. I don't trust them. My brother doesn't trust them, and he repeatedly refused their medical examination, demanding that an observer from his lawyers or the British consulate be present. This demand was never accepted. This is a man who has denied himself food for seven months because he wants to meet with his embassy. It's a very simple ask. Just let the embassy access. If that's... <clears throat> So to tell me that he could now be handcuffed to a bed, being force-fed, that this is some kind of a solution is grotesque. If that's the case, then he has been plunged into an even worse nightmare than he was already in. We know that they are happy for him to die. The only thing they care about is that it doesn't happen while the world is watching. But the world is watching, and it's not only watching the Egyptian authorities, it's also watching other governments, including the UK government and other Western governments complicit in our oppression, who benefit from our oppression. Everyone always talks about how strong the UK and Egypt relationship is. Is torturing a dual <coughs> citizen part of that strong relationship? This has to end. It can end. There are three ways for it to end. Let the British Embassy visit him, or put him in a plane out of Egypt today, or he will die, he will be relieved of this nightmare. But Ale shouldn't be forced anything against his will. I would also like to remind that my family's ordeal is it's an extreme example, but it's not the only example. There are tens of thousands of political prisoners in Egypt. There are more around the world. Climate activists get uh, arrested, kidnapped um, in Latin America. It's, we face the same uh, kind of oppression, and our cause is one. And I'm, I'm really, really thankful to your solidarity. That's Sana Saif speaking inside the UN Climate Summit today in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt, just before we went to broadcast about her imprisoned brother, Ala Abdel Fattah, who is 40 years old. Moments later, an Egyptian member of parliament, Amr Darwish, attempted to disrupt the press conference. Amnesty International Secretary General Agnès Calamar said the attempt to derail the press conference gives a quote, small sense of the regime of fears and silencing in the country right now. Unquote. Earlier in the news conference, the British climate activist Assad Raymond spoke on the need for international solidarity for Al Abdel Fattah. Here at COP27, civil society constituencies representing thousands of organizations and hundreds of millions of people are from around the world, from environmental, trade union, women and indigenous groups, are standing in support and with Allah, as we have done with all those who have been murdered for fighting and dreaming for a better world, from Berta Caceres in Honduras, Ken Sarawiwe in Nigeria, and Chutwati in Canada. Cambodia. So on behalf of UK movements, we have a message to the UK government and to the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Whilst the Egyptian authorities may have put Allah into a prison cell, the key to his release rests in your hands. This is a matter of life and death, of justice, of human rights. We will not accept any government, including the UK government, prioritizing arms sales and trade deals over the lives of our people. That's British climate activist Assad Rahman at the UN Climate Summit, known as COP27, which is currently taking place in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. Climate activists and scientists are warning the world is heading toward climate disaster without deeper cuts in planet heating emissions. They're also making the same demands and more here in the United States in the 2020 midterm elections taking place 
today. The outcome of the elections will be key in either advancing or torpedoing climate initiatives here, and could undermine President Biden's efforts to portray the U.S. as a climate leader, climate change-denying Republicans if they win overwhelmingly. For more, we're joined by Varshini Prakash, co-founder and executive director of the Sunrise Movement, which has been helping to get out the vote. <clears throat> Welcome back to Democracy Now! Varshini, we have a lot to take on here. Um, your organization, the Sunrise Movement, has always been a climate justice movement, combining the issue of climate crisis with human rights. At the U.N. Climate Summit, as we speak, we just heard the sister of Allah Abdel al-Fatah demanding his release from prison, a political prisoner. And at the same time, um, she and other climate activists are talking about the critical importance of being serious about dealing with the climate. Can you you put it all together for people here in the United States, and especially on this election day, what these elections mean, not only for the United States, but for the world. Absolutely. And thank you again for having me here. Um, we, as you have mentioned, we are up against a ticking time bomb of an unrelenting climate crisis. And an economic crisis that is bearing down on working people and already hurting so many. Um, this is not a domestic issue. This is a global issue. We have seen climate disasters like the hurricanes in Puerto Rico and Florida, the record heat waves all across Europe. I mean, Pakistan completely submerged, an entire country submerged, and the millions of climate refugees that are emerging from all of those collective crisis. So, you know, and as you mentioned, the, the absolute paltry amount that historical polluters that, the, like the United States, have contributed to countries uh, to, to support the reparations and the repair that will need to be done from these major disasters. And so, you know, we have passed earlier this year one of the largest pieces of climate legislation ever passed by a single country. And we saw how difficult it was to pass that climate legislation with a Democratic uh, majority holding the House and the Senate and presidency, the fact that it had to go through essentially a coal baron in Joe Manchin. And the stakes of this election, if we, if, if, either of those houses, if either the House or the Senate goes to Republicans, um, is essentially that we have lost even a greater shot at federal legislation. We are seeing Republicans running who have said before that climate change is bullshit. Um, that was Ron Johnson, sitting senator in Wisconsin, who Mandela Barnes is running against, who Sunrise has endorsed. They don't believe in climate action. And that is why this election is so critical, because what is on the ballot is not Democrat versus Republican. It is a chance at greater action to stave off the greatest crisis of our generation or, frankly, willful denial um, after decades of science that will lead to our collective annihilation. And so, you know, that is what is on the ballot today. Uh, well, Varshini, if that's true, uh, why do you why do you think that uh, the climate uh, crisis has registered so low in terms of all polling of Americans uh, as they head to the polls today? Whether it's uh, the Republicans, uh, the, their main concerns are uh, inflation, crime, immigration. Uh, on the Democratic side, it's the pres preservation of democracy and abortion, but very little talk of the continuing and uh, and escalating a catastrophe on the climate. Why is that registering still so low among the American public? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on in the world and in our country right now. And we have seen an effort on the part of Republicans to actively create disinformation and to revoke some of our most essential rights as humans um, as, as, as Americans in the last couple of years. Um, but I think something that brings me hope in this election, and I work with a lot of young people, already we are seeing more young people register to vote than we did even in 2018. And we are hoping for another 
record-breaking cycle for youth voter turnout. And I think a lot of that is because our generation is mobilized by things like taking action on climate change and student loan debt cancellation. It is essential that our government invests in our generation and in everyday people and that young people actually respond well to that federal investment in them. We've seen that in the polling as well. So looking at Biden's poll numbers from the spring to now, young people were deeply unexcited to vote months ago. And after Joe Biden passed a climate bill, a gun bill, and moved to cancel student loans, they have improved significantly. Um, there are still a lot of barriers along the way. And some of the, the, the main issues that we're hearing um, on the ground are that young people are don't have enough information. They aren't being communicated with in the way that other voters in these swing states do. But when they have the information and they are encouraged and supported to get out and vote, they are far more likely to vote for Democrats. Um, and so we're also hearing, you know, we've got young people, we've, we've made over 3 million voter contacts across the country. We've got, you know, young people in dorms and, and talking to, to thousands of young people. We're hearing that some of the top issues on the ground are climate change and abortion. And now we really have to connect the dots for people from the concerns they hold in their everyday lives to the policies that are being passed and the political terrain that can be won if they engage in these elections. And can you talk about how b both Democrats and Republicans are, are, are dealing with uh, what seems to be a, a uh, revival of the fossil fuel industry, largely as a result of the a war in Ukraine. You have the fracking industry in the United States, of course, now tr uh, rushing to to provide more uh, uh, gas to uh, to Europe as Europe searches for more sources of, of energy to replace uh, its uh, Russian supplies. Uh, how are both Democrats and Republicans how, dealing with this issue of, well, how do you fight climate change while at the same time allowing uh, new yeah. growth in uh, the fossil fuel industry? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, frankly, it's the same refrain that we have been hearing for 40, 50 years. It is the same playbook of, a, 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 of the richest industry in the history of the world that is attempting to protect its bottom line and using every tool in its toolbox in its dying years um, in order to do so. And so I think, frankly, what we saw with the war in Ukraine was uh, the fossil fuel industry using that moment to say, this is our opportunity to drill and frack um, and, and increase our reliance on oil, and we cannot afford to do so. I mean, we are seeing, everybody is seeing viscerally and with their own eyes, the impact that this crisis is having on them. And it is only gonna get worse from here. This is just the beginning. Um, and so we cannot afford to have this moment be increasing our dependency on uh, our addiction to oil and gas. We need to use this moment um, and, and push people like Joe Biden to declare a climate emergency, to utilize um, things like the Defense Production Act to ramp up the production of renewable energy and see it as, frankly, the largest national security threat that is posing uh, you know, us as in America, as well as uh, our global economy. Varshini Prakash, I want to thank you so much for being with us, co-founder and executive director of the Sunrise Movement, speaking to us from Boston, Massachusetts. Next week, Democracy Now! will be broadcasting throughout the week from Egypt, from the U.N. Climate Summit in Sharm el-Sheikh. And today, um, we are going to be doing a live three-hour broadcast tonight, beginning at 9 Eastern time, on the midterm elections. Check it out at democracynow.org. Next up, we go to Arizona, where Republicans are attempting to suppress voting on Native American reservations, then election protection on this midterm election day. We'll speak with the head of the Lawyers' Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Stay with us.
Out in the Rain by Sweeps. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We look now at how indigenous voters played a key role in Joe Biden's victory in 2020 when they helped him win Arizona, but now face a sweeping rollback of their voting rights. This comes as the top Republican candidates in close races in Arizona are 2020 election deniers, including the gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake and Blake Masters, who's running for U.S. Senate against Senator Mark Kelly. Last year, a Supreme Court ruling in the case Brnovich v. Democratic National Committee, which came out of Arizona, allowed the state to ban ballot collection from outside set precincts, which is a method that's widely used by Native voters in Arizona. The move is expected to suppress their vote. For more, we're joined by The New Yorker magazine staff writer Sue Halpern, who spoke to voters on Arizona's Navajo, Apache and Hopi reservations for The New Yorker, uh, in a new piece headlined The Political Attack on the Native American Vote. She's also a scholar in residence at Middlebury College, and she's joining us from Exeter, New Hampshire, where there is a key Senate contest going on between Maggie Hassan and General Bulldog. Also with us in Fort Apache, Arizona, is Lydia Dosella, the matriarch coordinator for the White Mountain Apache Tribe and the Northeast Arizona Native Democrats. Lydia's effort to get out the vote was featured in The New Yorker article. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Sue Halpern, let's begin with you. Give us the broad picture of what's happening on Native reservations across this country when it comes to today's vote. I was very struck by one of the Native American leaders you quoted who said, we used to talk about why participate in the colonizers' elections, who then changed his mind dramatically. Yeah, I think that what happened uh, was that in 2020, uh, Native voters understood that the election of Donald Trump was an existential problem for them. Uh, Trump was talking about opening up uranium mining again. He was talking about coal mining again. He was talking about taking sacred lands and turning them over to private industry. And so we saw this uh, remarkable increase in Native voting, even though in the past um, it was seen as a, a kind of attempt, I think, to co-opt Native voters and Native people on sovereign lands. And, and Sue Halpern, how does the, the voting process work on, uh, on the Native reservations? Because uh, there is supposedly a sovereignty that exists, a certain limited sovereignty among the, the Native peoples in terms of uh, their own laws and regulations within their territory. So how does that work in terms of, of voter participation? So uh, Native Americans are citizens of the United States. They have every right accorded to the United States citizens, which they are. Uh, the problem is that the government has been very uh, lax in making it easier and, in fact, just easy for Native Americans to vote. So things like post offices, which many of us just take for granted, don't exist for many, many people. Um, a lot of people have to um, use post boxes, which cost money, can cost money, which they don't have. And so when you vote on a reservation, ideally what you would be doing would be giving your ballot to someone, uh, a friend, a neighbor, a family member who can go to a drop box, who can go to a polling place and drop off your ballot. Um, but the Brnovich decision made that illegal. Um, and that is uh, really something that will impact Native American voters this time around. Lydia Dosella, you are the matriarch coordinator for the White Mountain Apache Tribe um, and the Northeast Arizona Native Democrats, featured in Sue Halpern's piece. So play this out for us. Explain the issues you face on reservations and what these changing laws have meant. I mean, many say it's the Native vote in 2020 that took Biden over the top in Arizona. The Native Americans, particularly with the Apache tribe, we have made our strong, powerful matriarchs 
that we have uh, talked to and basically address some of the issues, such as the one that Sue Harper had mentioned earlier. And they began to, uh, as they began to have their discussion and in their discussion with me, it was a, how can we overcome that? Our people are known to look for solutions versus dwelling on the problems. So the solution that they came up with is that, okay, instead of having to go uh, the, using the ballot box, we will now make every attempt to go through the early voting or voting on election day, because a lot of the issues that are facing our Native American reservation are the same thing as our neighboring towns and cities within the state. And it's no difference and with our tribal elections. We have uh, pretty much the same type of election process as the state and the federal processes. So understanding that, we began to form a society of sorts, which is actually the matriarchs, because they understand their role as matriarchs, and they are very powerful women and educators. They had taken upon themselves to start talking to family members, recruiting family members that have not yet registered to vote to start registering to vote, and also making it understood that they are expected to vote to turn this whole process back around to where all Native American voices are heard loud and clear, which becomes more stronger as more votes are cast. And uh, Lydia Dasala, you ran for a political office at one point yourself. You were once a deputy director for elderly services. What are the issues uh, that uh, you're hearing uh, in terms of the uh, your particular uh, uh, people, the White Mountain Apache tribe? What are the main issues that they're concerned about in this election? The main concerns that uh, that's been reiterated as I talked to from people all walks of life has basically been education, education for the children and then also for the, the, the unborn and also social security and then for the road system for health care and also the rising crime is also their concern and what they feel in their opinion should be done together with the state and the federal programs to bring that back down and how it all goes back to the community. If the community becomes more active in their tribal homelands as it is off reservation, then together we can build a strong arm to where we can say, okay, we've had enough of these issues. Let's do something about a crime rate. Perhaps we need to go back to our tribal teaching to also instill in the youngsters why it's so very important to go back to who they are, their identity as a Native Americans and understanding our relationship to other people and then having respect for our lands and everything that God has created. From that understanding, I began to talk more about in depth about, okay, now Social Security, what is it about that? They have heard through the news that the Republicans have thought about, uh, okay, perhaps we need to get that invested in Wall Street and see if it can start um, making revenue on its own uh, terms. And then they didn't like that because they had worked very hard and um, depositing their retirement funds into the Social Security. And then they also talked about the health system, you know, the health care. We had, uh, with all the, the, what happened with the pandemic is where the Native Americans had thought very deep and hard about health insurance, what we done, what needs to be done. And then the other one is the education. In order for our children to have the same opportunity as those off reservation, they began to understand that education is very important. And they want to have the same type of education that's offered elsewhere in the state then the reservation, on the reservation, we have shortages of teachers. We have substitute teachers for well into the school year. And the children do come home and then explain that we had a substitute, substitute teacher that was different from last week. And next week we have another one that's probably going to be different. And there is no continuity in their teachings. And their children feel that they are not learning or being taught as are their counterparts. And that's where the, the grandparents and the parents and other members of the community have it all said, okay, what do we need to do? And that's where in 
visiting the matriarchs, we have all began to understand why it's so very important that we need to come together. When we cast our votes, it become loud and clear that these are some of the issues that people that are elected that will be in these offices will no longer ignore us, but yet they will remember how loud and strong we came out by the elections result, how many votes were cast on Native American reservations. And time and time again, the elders have stressed that the times have changed. We also need to educate ourselves and to meet the changes of the new world. People always say that we can't, you know, we're not living in um, whippy wiki ups anymore. We have houses here. We also have housing shortage. But all of that is no different from the rest of the world. We also need to meet the demands of unemployment, health care, and education, and even a need for other programs. And also very important in talking to these elders was a pres preservation of our civil rights, which is voting. Well, and having that understood, a lot of uh, elders have, of matriarchs, and this, in my opinion, my particular case, having uh, made every effort to get their family members that are not registered to have them registered. And we were able to get uh, voter registration applications to them. We also helped them get it and have them mailed back. And we also, uh, in some cases, some have driven them back to the county office in Holbrook. Well, Lydia Dosella, we want to thank you for being with us, Matriarch Coordinator for the White Apache Mountain Tribe and the White Mountain Apache Tribe and the Northeast Arizona Native Democrats. Featured in Sue Halperin's New Yorker piece, The Political Attack on the Native American Vote. Sue, we'd like you to stay with us. We have two questions on pieces you've written. We're talking to you in Exeter, New Hampshire. Uh, the Guardian newspaper reported last week a New Hampshire school has rebuked the Republican U.S. Senate candidate Don Bulldock for claiming school children were identifying as furries and fuzzies in classrooms, using litter trays and licking themselves and each other. In the audio, Bulldock said, guess what? We have furries and fuzzies in classrooms. They lick themselves, their cats. When they don't like something, they hiss. People walk down the hallway and jump out and get this, get this. They're putting litter boxes, right? They're the same people that are concerned about spreading germs, yet they lick themselves and then touch everything. And they're starting to lick each other. I mean, it is astounding. It is a refrain that is being used by Republican candidates around the country. Get litter boxes boxes out of schools, though they aren't in schools. But this general, also fiercely um, anti-choice, uh, Trump ally, is in an extremely close race with the Democratic incumbent senator, Maggie Hassan. What have you been finding there? You know, it's really interesting. Uh, I went to General Baldock's last town hall meeting, which is last night. Uh, it was very well attended. And I expected a kind of Carrie Lake, you know, just rabble rouser kind of uh, chest thumping guy. Um, in fact, he came across as being very reasonable, um, moderated tone, um, friendly. Uh, he said nothing about furries. He said very little about abortion. He said almost nothing that was sort of off the general um, Republican playbook. It was it was quite interesting. Um, obviously, he really hasn't walked back a lot of the things that he said in the press, um, but he didn't mention any of them last night um, in his uh, attempt, I think, to kind of calm the independent spirit of, of Republican voters here in New Hampshire who may not be sort of all in for Trump, um, but are all in for the Republican agenda. And your sense of what it would signal if uh, Maggie Hassan loses, loses uh, this race uh, tonight, or what it might signal for the uh, overall uh, Democratic hopes of retaining uh, the Senate and the House? Yeah, I mean, if Maggie Hassan loses, uh, the Democrats might well lose the Senate. Um, I think that Baldock has actually run a very, very vigorous campaign. He's been campaigning for two years. He's gone to every single town and city in this state. Um, he knows a lot of people. 
he, you know, and I think that, you know, people want to feel like they're being heard and, you know, there he is, he's, you know, he's there, he's listening. So, you know, it's a very swingy state, New Hampshire. They like to break the mold. Um, and this might be one of the ways that they do it. They also have a very, very uh, vigorous young uh, congressional candidate named uh, Caroline Levitt, who um, is also very popular. She worked for Trump. She's much more of a Trump cheerleader, I think, than Baldock, who was not endorsed by Trump, who, but, you know, who clearly subscribes to sort of the Trump sensibility. Finally, we have less than a minute, but you just finished a piece on election software, particularly in Georgia. Uh, what did you find? So there's a county in Georgia called Coffee County, which, by the way, is a, a deeply Republican county. But Sidney Powell, Trump's lawyer, paid uh, a forensic company to go in there and copy all of the election software uh, in Coffee County. But it turns out that Georgia uses the same voting machines and software on all of its voting equipment. Um, that uh, attempt to, or not, it was actually, you know, a very successful uh, attempt to copy all of the software and all of the data was then given to um, some election deniers um, who we've seen uh, active in other states. And so we don't really know, you know, what they might do or have done with that software Hopefully, you know, the the kinds of protections that are in place will make that very hard to um, to use, but we just don't know. Well, Sue Halpern, I want to thank you for being with us, staff writer at The New Yorker. Her latest piece headlined The Political Attack on the Native American Vote, scholar in residence at Middlebury College in Vermont, where we will be going tonight in our three-hour midterm election night special. Um, we'll be broadcasting, uh, speaking with people from all over the country as this pivotal election takes place. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we look at election protection. Stay with us. Black Belt Eagle Scout. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Uh, we are continuing our midterm election coverage. And again, tune in tonight at 9 p.m. for a three hour election special at democracynow.org or watch if your station, wherever you are, is broadcasting the show. We end today's show looking at election protection efforts in the 2022 midterm election. In Georgia, the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center won a victory late Monday. Monday, after suing Cobb County, which includes Atlanta, for accepting voters' applications for absentee ballots, then failing to mail those ballots to hundreds of absentee voters. The ACLU asked a judge to require the county to send ballots by overnight mail and extend the state's deadline to return them. Georgia has two of the most closely watched races in the country, Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock versus the Trump-backed Herschel Walker, and the gubernatorial race between Georgia Governor Brian and Kemp and Democrat, Democratic voting rights activist Stacey Abrams. 
election workers have also faced threats around the country. Reuters has documented more than 100 violent threats faced by election workers in Arizona's Maricopa County in the run-up to today's election, including, quote, menacing emails and social media posts, threats to circulate personal information online, and photographing employees arriving at work. Meanwhile, Republicans at the national and state levels are also trying to disqualify thousands of absentee and mail-in ballots in an effort to swing close races in battleground states like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. For more, we're joined in Washington, D.C., by Damon Hewitt, president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, which coordinates a national nonpartisan election protection coalition. They have an election protection hotline at 866-HOUR-VOTE. Damon Hewitt, welcome to Democracy Now! Talk about what election protection means, including the emergency litigation you've just filed in Texas challenging voter intimidation practices at a historically black polling site in Beaumont. Well, thanks so much, Amy, for your coverage. So, the Election Protection Coalition came together after the debacle in the 2000 election. A number of organizations came together to develop a program, a, a, an entire a cohesive approach to how we can stand in the breach to protect voters. So, we have the hotline 866 Our Vote, which is active right now. In fact, it's active 365 days a year that voters can call. And when voters can report problems or ask questions, but when they report problems, we can deploy lawyers to act. And sadly, this is necessary because, as you see in Georgia and Arizona, whether it is problems in the fundamental apparatus of simply getting out mail-in ballots, or whether it's people with weapons menacing people at the polls, these things require action. Just last night in Beaumont, Texas, we had to file a lawsuit in federal district court just to address the fact that, in a particular polling place, white poll workers were menacing, harassing and turning away, improperly, black voters. Uh, we had people submit affidavits indicating that they had uh, poll workers standing over them as they were completing their ballots so that they could see exactly how they were voting. Some people were turned away improperly. It was so bad, Amy, that black poll workers at the same site had to submit affidavits complaining about the white poll workers. And so it just shows that when the casualness of racism is weaponized in the electoral process, that leads to voter suppression if we don't stand up. And in terms of these, uh, this uh, unprecedented situation here, as we saw in Arizona and we may see in other places of, of uh, people uh, standing at drop boxes with, uh, uh, with guns uh, as people are, are dropping off their ballots, uh, what, what's your sense of how this can be uh, prevented? Because by the time uh, the, the challenge goes into court, uh, hours may have passed and, and already uh, people may have been dissuaded from voting. Well, that's exactly right. You know, the legal process last night worked for us because we did get a favorable court order. The presiding election uh, poll worker, a poll election judge, as they call it, uh, in, in that county of Texas, will be removed, and the others have been banned from those practices that are discriminatory. But sometimes the legal process takes more time than we have on election day. And so that's why it's so important that we have both deterrent and prophylactic effect. Part of the deterrent is our volunteers. We have over 11,000 volunteers just for this cycle, attorneys who have been trained to take these calls. We have partners on the ground in various communities, including lawyers ready to, to fan out as needed. But also, the U.S. Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division is sending monitors to 24 different states. That's part of the prophylactic. But at the end of the day, we also need the chief election officials at the state and local level, your secretaries of state, your county boards of elections, to actually do the right thing. And the more that these are co-opted by people who actually want to disrupt the process in a discriminatory or unhealthy or non-democratic way, uh, then we're in trouble. And, of course, it's not just what happens before or on Election Day, but then in the counting process as well, the tabulation of the votes. And uh, there are expectations that there will be much more uh, controversy and uh, legal battles uh, during the uh, ch either challenging votes or the process of counting votes. How are you preparing for that? 
Well, we're preparing for it just the way we did in 2020. We learned a lot of lessons. Uh, after the 2020 election day, uh, we actually participated at the Lawyers Committee in 15 post-election lawsuits, where there were people who were trying to overturn the legitimate results of, of, of valid elections. And so we know that this type of election threat uh, is persistent. We've been partnering with other organizations, legal organizations, to get ready for that. And it's really a matter of understanding state law uh, and all of the hot-button uh, high-impact states uh, where we think this activity is likely to happen. But we have heard so many claims and fears and even plans uh, from those who want to disrupt democracy who say, we want to disrupt the vote count, or that they intend to challenge absentee or mail votes. And, you know, Americans have to be prepared. I want the audience to know that elections can take time. You may not know the results in your jurisdiction tonight. You may not know the results uh, even for the federal balance of power in Congress uh, for a few days, because in some states, the poll workers can't even start the canvassing process, the process of counting the mail absentee or even provisional ballots, until after election night is over, until the, the polls are closed. So these things take time, and there probably will be some litigation as well. I wanted to ask you about the lawsuit that um, the senatorial candidate in Pennsylvania, John Fetterman, has just filed. Um, on Monday, he filed a federal lawsuit in an effort to have mail-in ballots be counted, even if they're undated or improperly dated. Uh, Republicans have sued to disqualify thousands of mail-in ballots, as you mentioned, in key swing states, including Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. And specifically in Pennsylvania, I mean, we're talking about how you write uh, if you put in the date on the envelope that contains your ballot, um, if it's improperly dated, if it's there at all. And the Republicans are attempting to disqualify thousands of these. Yeah, that's it, just it's basically, uh, you know, a very simple quote unquote rule but also another one of these devious methods to try to make it either harder for people to vote or to make sure that even if you vote, uh, that your vote isn't counted. And I think that's the new frontier, Amy. It's not just uh, voter suppression before you get to the polling place. As you said, it's after uh, you cast your ballot as well. They're trying to block off all of these means. And so hopefully the litigation to free the vote, to allow people's votes to be counted, will be uh, successful on a nonpartisan basis. Uh, these, these battles are always framed as Democrats versus Republicans, Republicans versus Democrats. But who gets stuck in the middle are black voters, are young voters who are first-time voters, especially, and also elderly voters, the people who are most likely uh, to not fill out uh, that one little piece of information, that date, or to maybe think, oh, they want my date of birth, or to, you know, be distracted by your kids and scribble-scratch in a way that may not be legible. It really shouldn't matter. And so the, the litigation uh, is designed to make sure that the voters' intent is actually honored, respected, and held high. And I'm wondering uh, your uh, evaluation of the tactic of, of President Trump, his supporters, and the MAGA movement to have their, uh, those who support th their viewpoints vote in person on election day, uh, as opposed to voting by mail, and which makes it uh, possible to do mass challenges of uh, mail-in ballots. It also means that their votes get counted first and then create a uh, sort of a perception of who's the actual winner. Uh, th the possibility that more and more the country is developing and that Democrats mostly, mostly vote by mail and, uh, and Republicans vote in person. Well, it's, it's, it's bizarre world, because pre-pandemic, uh, for black voters whom I've served, you know, we've served throughout our career and, and our organization's uh, career over 60 years here, uh, we know that black voters pre-pandemic tended to vote in person. So to the polls, for example, on, on you know, uh, during early voting on the Sunday. And so the, the idea was that during the pandemic, there were more avenues open. So all of a sudden, when black folks brown folks start voting by mail, all of a sudden it becomes uh, a problem uh, for a political party or a problem for those who want to suppress their vote. And so, you know, every pathway to voting should be open to everyone, regardless of race, creed, or political party. That includes mail voting and absentee voting. Uh, and so, you know, the idea that one could or should discredit 
uh, somehow a particular pathway to voting is absolutely ridiculous. It's almost as if they're trying to racialize somehow mail-in voting, as uh, if it's Damon something— Damon Hewitt, we're going to have to leave no. it there. I thank you so much for being with us, President and Executive Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Election Protection Hotline is 866-HOUR-VOTE, if anyone has any trouble. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.